Because you know, to write, you just have to sit alone in a room. It's, um, it's, not, it's not very fun. I'm always wondering about all those people who have really exciting things, but they want to be a writer. <laughs> uh, like they're like a movie star mm -hmm. or they're a musician, something really good. And they're just like, what I really want to do is write a novel. <laughs> <You're> like, really? <laughs> Good evening, welcome everyone. Happy to see you in such great numbers. Uh, my name is Ianta Mosselman. I'm a program editor here at the Bali. Uh, and tonight I have the honor of speaking with Jenny Offiel. She's an internationally acclaimed fiction writer, novelist and editor. Her debut novel, Last Things, was a New York Times notable book and a finalist for the LA Times First Book Award. Her second book, Depth of Speculation, was named one of the 10 best books of 2014 by the New York Times Book Review. In her 2020, in 2020, her novel Weather was published and shortlisted for the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction. She teaches, she wrote a number of children's book, uh, books, and this July, she is writer in residence in Amsterdam for the Dutch Foundation for Literature. Please give her a very warm welcome. Thank you. Before we're going to <laughs> join in conversation, we're going to listen to Marjolein van Heemstra. Uh, and she will give a short introduction for this program. Uh, a bit of this is in Dutch and a bit is in, uh, is in Dutch, so I need to know who does not understand Dutch. Okay, I'm coming towards you too with a, <laughs> a translation. Um, Marjolein van Heemstra is a theater producer, writer and poet. Her debut... Als Moses had doorgevraagd, was nominated for the Say Bidding Prijs en awarded the Jo Peters Poetry Award. And since 2000, 2019, she is the space correspondent for The Correspondent. And her work in Light Years, Nobody is in a Hurry, um, in English, <laughs> in Lichtjaren heeft niemand haast, was awarded as the best non-fiction book of the year. And since January, January 2022, she is the city poet of Amsterdam. So please give her a warm applause. Good evening, everyone. I think I have to change this a little bit. Ben ik zo, yeah? Very nice to be here. Uh, I read your books with much pleasure, so <laughs> it's nice to see you again. I saw you seven years ago. Um, I was asked to read a fragment of my work that somehow echoes a little bit of uh, uh, Jenny Offel's work. Um, and I was uh, rereading weather last week, and then I thought of something that would suit this evening. And actually, the first thing I thought of was uh, my neighbor, Bob. So I will show him to you. So this is Bob. And Bob, uh, he lives uh, right next to me. And he became uh, a character in my latest book, uh, <laughs> There's No Hurry in Light Years. It's a bit strange to translate. Um, and part of this book is about trying to find a strategy to cope with an apocalyptic future that I think a lot of us feel is um, what we're heading for. Uh, just like the protagonist in weather, actually, Lizzie. Only instead of prepping, like Lizzie does, I start to zoom out in this book. I figure with all the brokenness around me and the lack of perspective, I need to search for the largest possible perspective that I can think of, so it will be the universe. And for two years, I made this space journey on Earth, uh, visiting places of research, uh, telescopes, scientists, poets, uh, theologians, theologians, yeah, theolog, who are in, uh, who are each in their own way uh, researching our relationship with the big unknown. But um, I was actually trying to sort of cultivate the attitude of an astronaut, zooming out, seeing the interconnectedness of everything, just like. Uh, space travelers do when they look at the Earth from space. But while following the stars and far-off worlds, uh, Bob constantly reminded me of the big unknown right in front of my house and of the brokenness that I step into every day. So Bob is actually the best neighbor I've ever had. Here you see our two front doors. He's very close to me. Uh, we share this really tiny uh, front garden. I often borrow his car. We talk about the plans that we together take care of, about his hobbies his uh, fish and his volunteer job as the driver of an ambulance of the Red Cross. Um, you see him here. 
but I only meet him on the square meters that we share. I never see Bob in the supermarket that I go to, not in the hipster cafe where I drink my flat white, not in the fancy boutique cinema that opened in our neighborhood recently. All we share is a piece of earth. Bob, who is seen in this neighborhood, my neighborhood, as someone who actually belongs, where I am after 10 years still the import. Bob, who really suffers from the gentrification that I am, in all honesty, the face of. In the story about our neighborhood, we take opposite stands. So I thought if I want to train the attitude of an astronaut, sort of seeing the wholeness and the connection, shouldn't I start by breaching the gap in my own front garden? <laughs> Bridge the gap between me and planet Bob. <laughs> so here's a fragment of me trying to involve Bob in my space journey on Earth. <laughs> and uh, it's about two thirds of the book. You have the English, uh, English people have the English chance. Bob wijst naar zijn aquarium, de vissen waar mijn kinderen zo graag naar kijken. Mijn zondagsrust, zegt hij. I can show you the aquarium. Ik ga niet naar de kerk, maar als ik naar die vissen kijk, is het toch een soort van bidden. Even staren we in stilte naar de halfsnavelbekjes en de zesstreeparbeel. En ik vraag Bob of hij ooit naar de ruimte heeft gewild. Hij knikt. Ik herinner me de maanlanding heel goed. Die opwinding daarover, dat gevoel dat er iets kon wat daarvoor nooit kon. Dat wilde ik ook. Van het overzichtseffect, wat astronauten ervaren, heeft hij nooit gehoord. Maar hij kan zich daar iets bij voorstellen. Vroeger had ik honden. Dan liep ik vaak heel lang. Dan keek ik naar de lucht, de wolken. Daar werd ik rustig van. Soms nam ik ze mee naar het strand. Dan liepen we tot zonsondergang. En al die kleuren aan de horizon, magisch. Ik denk dat het zo'n gevoel is, dat grootste. Ik vraag of hij zich ook iets kan voorstellen bij het idee een ruimtevaarder op aarde te zijn. Dat is niet zo moeilijk, zegt hij. Kijk, tijdens het wandelen om je heen en je ziet de zon, de maan, de lucht, de ruimte. Wandelen, goed kijken. Dat is genoeg om dat te voelen. Ik knik en denk aan alles wat ik hem had willen zeggen over mijn ruimtereis op aarde. Over de verloren sterrenhemel, de maan die ons twee keer per dag naar zich toe trekt. Over de algen die ons vergezellen naar Mars. Hoe diffuus de grenzen van een mens blijken te zijn. In hoeveel tempo lagen we blijken te leven. Hoe we het vreemde vertrouwd moeten maken als we buitenaardse intelligentie willen herkennen. Maar misschien laat het zich allemaal wel zo ongeveer samenvatten door Bob's analyse. Goed kijken. Naar de hemel. Naar elkaar. En hoe deel je dan met anderen wat dat kijken teweeg brengt, vraag ik. Bob draait zijn hoofd mijn kant op. Ik snap niet waar je heen wilt. Nou begin ik aarzelend. Hoe uh, zou je zo'n ervaring kunnen gebruiken om de afstand te overbruggen tussen jezelf en de mensen tot wie je afstand voelt? Ik zucht. Waarom klinkt het zo vaag terwijl ik iets simpels bedoel? Ik probeer het nog een keer. Hoe zou dat gevoel dat wij ruimtevaarders zijn op aarde, hoe kun je die ervaring delen? Niet om de verschillen weg te strijken, maar om iets te herstellen en ik val stil. Bob heeft zijn hoofd weer richting de vissen gedraaid. Tja, zegt hij. Normaal denk ik aan één stuk door. Ik moet dit, ik moet dat, ik, ik. Maar na zo'n lange wandeling, dan, dan had ik dat niet. Dan was ik helemaal relaxed. En als je relaxed bent, kun je openstaan. Dan ga je luisteren. Want als je haast hebt, heb je stress, dan hoor je niks. Maar als je relaxed bent, dan heb je ruimte. Dan begin je te denken hoe je die en die kan helpen. Wat je kan betekenen. Dus als ik jouw vragen goed begrijp, is mijn antwoord wandelen. En als je dat gevoel wilt delen met iemand, dan neem je die dus mee. Er valt een straal avondzon door het raam naar binnen... Ik zie ontelbaar kleine deeltjes dansen en ik voel weer dat ontzag voor die straling die ons bereikt met een snelheid van 1 miljard kilometer per uur. De lampjes in het aquarium verspringen van geel naar paars en dan naar groen. Dat is nieuw, zegt Bob. Gezelligheid voor de vissen. Je had ze moeten zien vanmorgen. Ze schoten alle kanten op in het licht van die lampjes. was net een kermis. Ik denk aan het spoor van wetenschappers, gedachten, boeken, artikelen, films, podcasts dat ik dit jaar volgde. Kijkend naar de vissen in hun verspringende discolicht... lijkt het ineens alsof de hele weg altijd al naar hier zou leiden. Alsof het niet anders had gekund dan dat ik via de Maan, Mars en Proxima Centauri B... in deze woonkamer op deze bank zou belanden. Via lichtjaren in het nu van deze zomeravond. Dank je. Dank je. Dank je. Heel veel dank, Marjolein van Heemstra. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so I forgot to say two very important things in the beginning. Okay. Uh, first is that it's a cooperation with SLA. 
And second is that you will be signing books afterwards. So uh, that's good for you to know. <laughs> okay, starting. Um, so I want to start with your last two, your latest two books. And they are built, uh, you will read something later on, but they were built out of little fragments, memories, anecdotes, snippets of conversations. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, how do you start? Do you gather them? So you take all these little bits and pieces and build up a story, or do you have the story and then have all these information mm. bubbles that you... I definitely start by gathering them. Sometimes it's, um, it's almost like <coughs> I think about my own interest as like a compass. Mm -hmm. And if something is sort of going towards it, then I'll, I'll take notes on it or I'll write it down and I won't necessarily know how it's all gonna come into play later. Often I'm thinking of kind of, if anything, an emotion. Like with, with Department of Speculation, I was thinking a lot about loneliness. Mm -hmm. Like the loneliness you might have when you are actually solitary and the loneliness you can still have when you're with other people. And then with weather, I was thinking a lot about dread. Um, not only in terms of like the big picture and the climate stuff, but just about that sort of anticipatory dread that we all feel sometimes. And so I began to gather little things about it. And um, it's funny because my books are so short, but they take me so long to write that people often say like, mm -hmm. is there another, you know, I wish, I wish there was like mm -hmm. another pages in a drawer that I could somehow uh, put together with glue and string and uh, ship out. But, but what I do have is tons of notes, like in department, it was so wonderful to hear all the stuff about um, astronauts because I was obsessed with, uh, you know, sort of astronaut stories when mm -hmm. I was writing that book. And so I have maybe 300 pages of strange little anecdotes and notes. Mm -hmm. um, but it takes a little while for me to figure out. And then the, the part that's more story is more like listening for a sentence or two that gives me a starting point. It gets a little more reasonable as I go further in. But the beginning process is extremely... Mm -hmm. Inefficient. <laughs> <laughs> and do the did the sentences that became your starting point are they still the starting point of the book? Do you stay with them? Um, not always. No. Mm -mm. I I sometimes will write for a little while and then I'll I'll think oh no that that's the beginning mm -hmm. um, and then I'll either cut what was before or see if it goes somewhere else. I have the same feeling when I hit the end. Sometimes I think oh that's the end mm -hmm. and then I'll just put it there. Um, it's really my only, <laughs> my only feeling of, of certainty is somehow those two things kind of have a, have a feeling to them. And if they don't stick, you'll feel it right away because you have to look at the beginning. I, I tend to start from wherever I left off and I'll start at the beginning. And so if it was, you know how it is if you're a writer, I'm sure many of you are writers, um, you know, you're just always swinging back and forth between like grandiosity and self-loathing. So if you happen to think <laughs> that, oh, this was, oh, that was a fantastic opening. Um, the next day when you come in with the self-loathing, uh, it, it might not stick and then you'll have to change, change it. Change it again. Yeah. yeah. So that's how I know that it really is the beginning if I don't, if and, I don't change it. And do you look for them or do they have to sort of find you in a way? I mean, do in I look for them? I guess I do. I mean, I, I sort of... Um, I mean, it's interesting in weather because I'm, you know, I'm writing about somebody that, that could have been an academic but yeah. sort of turned away from that path. And, um, and I'm somebody, I do, I really just like to read, like I, I read an entire book about Puritans just to get the epigraph of this book. I love to just read in areas that are not something that I already understand. Um, and so I think that sometimes I'll just kind of be reading in an area and something will start going towards me. Um, and then it begins to, you know, ideally it's like little points of light and slowly you start to think there's a constellation mm -hmm. of some sort. I mean, on the other hand, you know, when we look at the sky and see a constellation, depending on where we are in the world, we might be like, oh, that's a bull or that's a dipper or that's, but of course it's still made up. So that the, the fear when you a writing like this is that you'll give it to someone and they'll just be like, I don't see anything. I don't, I don't see how it goes together. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't understand these points that you are seeing as connected. I read in an interview you say that uh, because there's a lot of white uh, uh, in between the, the, the bits that you write and that you try to see it as a conversation where you don't fill in too much. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering about that because if you're having a conversation, sometimes people talk too much 
They talk too little. <laughs> how do you know how to balance? Um, I mean, and this, I guess I think of it in terms of, um, in, in the U.S., sometimes with fiction and novels, there, there will be kind of, I, mean, I used to joke to my graduate students who were in a writing workshop that I would get everybody a T-shirt that said, I wanted to know more, because that's like <laughs> what just people say when they're workshopping a story. They're, they're just like, even if you don't know what it is, you're just like, maybe more. And I think that I am always sort of interested in like less. How mm -hmm. could you distill something more? And so um, sometimes there's this feeling in the way that the, a lot of the books that are written in the U.S. is like, you really need to spell things out for the reader. You really need to make sure that at every moment, you know, they kind of know where you're going and they trust you. And I always just feel that kind of underestimates like most readers mm -hmm. because I think that they're bringing their own train of associations and things. And so the white space is just meant to be like a little, like the way negative space would be in a painting or something mm -hmm. um, that it, it gives. And also my, my narrators often sort of manic and galloping along. And so it's also meant to give you a break from this slightly claustrophobic uh, point of view. Would you, I think uh, maybe for someone who hasn't read it, would you read a bit? Sure. Uh, the, I think the, yeah, the first bit from page 19 and then I'm briefly gonna say for the people who haven't read Weather yet, uh, what it's about? Is that Great, okay? please oh, uh, save me from please doing correct, it. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, but in the in the book, whether we follow Lizzie, and she's a university librarian. She could have been an academic, of course, but she didn't finish uh, her PhD. And she responds to the email sent into hell or high water. And that's a climate-focused podcast hosted by her former academic mentor. Uh, and that gets her, well, her mind circling around the topic of climate change. Um, and, well, in the meantime, she's also struggling to balance her life and her responsibilities as a wife, mother, sister, daughter, friends, all the other things she is. And she takes care of a lot of other people. If that's correct. Yes, that's good. good. I'm going I'm to <laughs> employ you to write, <laughs> write that for me. It's much better than I do. Um, uh, okay, so this is just a section from a little ways in, and um, I don't think you really have to know any more than that, other than that um, her son, who's in kindergarten, um, is named Eli, and her husband's named Ben. Sunday morning. The dog has found a baby bunny in the grass. She closed her mouth around it once, then released it. Now we are trying to save it. Someone at the community garden has given us a box lined with soft cloth, but it is trembling violently. There's no blood anywhere, but there are small indents in the fur that show where her teeth have been. We try to put it back in the garden, but it has already died. A fright, I think. That night, my son calls to us hysterically from the kitchen. There's a mouse skull under the sink, he says. I give Ben a dark look. We are killing them secretly, I thought. Heavily, he rises to go in there. He gets down on his knees to look under the sink, but it is only a knob of ginger, and we are saved. Um, this is a about when she's going to see her former mentor um, give a, a talk. I don't know what to do about this car service man. He told me business is down, no one is calling anymore. He had to let all his drivers go and is down to one car. He sleeps at work now, so as never to miss a call. His wife has said she's going to leave him. Mr. Jimmy, that's the name on the card he gave me. I try to use only his car service now, not the better faster one. Sometimes when I call, his voice is groggy. He says always that he will be there in seven minutes, but it's much longer now. I used to take a car service only if I was going to be late, but now I find I am building in double the amount of travel time. A bus would be the same or faster. Also, I could afford it. But what if I'm the only customer he has left? I'm late for the lecture now. And I was wrong about what building it's in. By the time I get there, Sylvie is almost through speaking. There's a big crowd. Behind her is a graph shaped like a hockey stick. What it means to be a good person, a moral person, is calculated differently in times of crisis than in ordinary circumstances, 
she says. She pulls up a slide of people having a picnic by a lake. Blue skies, green trees, white people. Suppose you go with some friends to the park to have a picnic. This act is, of course, morally neutral. But if you witness a group of children drowning in the lake and you continue to eat and chat, you have become monstrous. The moderator makes a gesture to show it is time to wrap up. A line of men is forming behind the microphone. I have both a question and a comment, they say. <laughs> A young woman stands up to wait in line. I watch as she inches forward. Finally, she makes it to the front to ask her question. How do you maintain your optimism? I can't even get to Sylvia afterward. There are too many people. I walk to the subway, trying to think about the world. Young person worry. What if nothing I do matters? Old person worry. What if everything I do does? For almost two years, I have managed not to run into this mother from the old preschool. At times, it takes some doing. I definitely have to be eagle-eyed if I venture into the fancy bakery or the co-op. Her name is Nicola, and her son's name, inexplicably, is Casper. <laughs> She had this way that she would talk about our zoned elementary school, in one breath praising the immigrant kids who went there, and in the next, talking about the tutors she'd hired to get her son out of it. Strivers, she called them, like they were all cleaning chimneys or selling papers hot off the press. Nicola used to carry flashcards with her, and she'd greet her son at pickup with a snack that she said the name of in another language. Pom, banan. Eli was enamored with her. He wanted me to wear nicer clothes. He wanted me to teach him the foreign names of fruit. One day, I brought him an orange. In French, orange. <laughs> I told him he could take the test if he wanted, but there would be, of course, no pricey tutors. A few days later, I yelled at him for losing his new lunchbox, and he turned to me and said, are you sure you're my mother? <laughs> Sometimes you don't seem like a good enough person. He was just a kid, so I let it go. And now, years later, I probably only think of it, I don't know, once or twice a day. <laughs> It's a beautiful fragment, I think, because you, <laughs> you, you swap around so beautifully to, between the big and the little thoughts. Mm. But I also really, really like the ending because it's so hard and cruel in a mm. way. And I was wondering, do you have a really good, because it, um, children, so in the, in the depth of speculation, uh, the kid says to her mother when she accidentally ruins her blanket, that was my best thing. Why would you ruin my best thing? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, do you, have a, do you think you have a really good eye for cruelness? <laughs> <laughs> you see it when it happens. Um, well, I think anyone that's ever been a parent knows that, uh, I mean, that's why Shakespeare wrote that thing, sharper than a serpent's tooth, an ungrateful child. Since I just look to my husband and I just mutter under my breath, serpent's tooth, <laughs> serpent's <laughs> tooth. Um, but I think kids, the cruelty of kids comes from them not necessarily following the niceties of, of what you're supposed to say, uh, that sort of unvarnished feeling, which I find both sort of interesting and exhilarating and also you know, incredibly painful when I'm mm -hmm. the uh, target of it. And, um, and so I think, I think what I... What I hope to sort of notice, I guess, is, is moments that, on the surface, the words wouldn't necessarily seem like they were so terrible. But in context, um, th that, they, that they feel like they have a real sting to them. So I do look for those. And I also look for moments when people are saying one thing, um, but clearly sort of meaning another. Um, and so I'm always looking at those little spaces sort of between what you might expect someone would say or do and what they actually do. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you make them up or do you notice them? Um, I believe my daughter actually said that to me uh, <laughs> once. Um, but I, 
I have this thing with anything that I use that is like uh, something that a kid said because I mean, I'm I'm sure uh, we've all experienced the thing where someone is telling you a story about their child that it, to them is just fascinating and and so interesting and adorable and and you just are thinking the whole time like will is is there a way that this could just end <laughs> you know could this story end and sometimes the stories are funny or interesting at the end but sometimes they're just kids say the darndest things you know mm -hmm. and so i tend in some ways using something that my daughter said is um is a little bit out of character from what i usually do because i feel like i can judge a lot better when another child says something if i think it's interesting mm -hmm. so i tend to not necessarily mind my own life for um for those moments as much as, but I, especially when I was living in New York, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, sitting on the bench in the playground and overhearing various things. I mean, that's the great thing about living in a, a, a city. Um, you know, you can, you can eavesdrop on people without seeming to. And is it because of the, the hardness and the, the honesty maybe also that's in it that you like writing about it? <clears throat> I think I just feel like, um, to be honest, I think it's just, it, it this attention to the sort of nuance of the way people say things, whether it's children or adults, and the feeling of, of it sort of um, hitting a little too hard, mm -hmm. I think it comes from just like being a depressive person most of my life. So there were like huge periods in my life where like something would feel like it was very um, harsh that was said to me and maybe no one else would have even thought that. Um, because I just sort of felt like a, like a turtle with no shell. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that those moments, um, you know, even when the depression receded, um, I still sort of had that, uh, way of perceiving things. Um, and you know, I feel like the other thing is just humor often comes from, from that same thing, from that, like, expecting things to go one way and then they go another way. Um, and so that that tonally shifting, I think it's just, it feels very useful to me as a writer. The books I like the most often, you know, are kind of like funny and sad, or they, they manage to um, do, do both things. Uh, I wanna speak a bit more about Lizzie. Mm -hmm. She's a librarian. Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> um, I think it's just, you know, you have those other ideas of things you could have been. Mm -hmm. I, I think I could have very happily been a librarian, although um, I decided it's a lot harder to be a librarian than, um, of course, it seems. And now you have to, um, at least in America, you have to have all these other abilities. Um, you're kind of a first responder. Like mm -hmm. you might have to give Narcan to someone in the bathroom. You are helping people with their tax forms. Um, it's not but like you, it used to be. No, but if you sit next to someone, you know, on a plane or a bus and, and they ask you what you do and you say you're a librarian, invariably uh, somebody will say, oh, aren't you lucky? You just get to sit around and read books all day. Yeah. And if you know a librarian, you know that that makes them insane. <laughs> because actually, you know, they're, they're doing so many more things and they're also very technically adept now and everything. But um, I wanted, I guess, often writers will create um, in their story, is very common, a painter so that they can, like whenever the person would be writing, they're, they're painting, yes. you know, and then there'll be like a few little you know, pausing and then they'll have to throw in a few art terms and everything. Um, and because I didn't want, this character to be a writer, like mm -hmm. the character in Department. Um, I just felt like something bookish that I could imagine uh, really wanting to be and really liking being. And I also had this idea of like the library is this last non-commercial space in, in the States it, where anyone can come to it. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like now if someone tried to propose libraries, if libraries didn't exist, the Republicans would be like, that's an insane idea. Of course, we're not going to let people take, take free books. books for free. And even, you know, in some really progressive communities, they have libraries of things where you can go and borrow. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is not, you know, impressive at all to Europeans. But, you know, you can go and borrow um, toys or you can get, there'll be a bike library or, or yeah. a tool library or things like that. So in general, there, there are these spaces that I feel like are a real, I guess, model mm -hmm. of, um, of how to be in community with other people. Um, so that was that was why I came. I also wanted. I feel like so many people I know 
and they're not necessarily doing the thing they set out to be doing. Um, and, and sometimes that causes like sadness and regret, and sometimes, it's, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes they've just taken a different path and they've, mm -hmm. they turned up somewhere. But I really, after writing about someone who was very single-minded in a way, uh, sort of uh, about being an artist or a writer, I wanted to write about someone who just kind of took a different route mm -hmm. and who actually, um, her life was more determined by other people that she was sort of in caring for. And Lizzie's okay with it, you think? I mean, maybe. Um, I think that I, I think she is sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a moment in in weather where she has a sort of um, a crush on this war reporter, mm -hmm. and um, and he's going back to Canada, and and he sort of says to her, like, "What's keeping you here?" And and she just says, "I I have so many people, you wouldn't believe it." Like, yeah. and I just think that that is that feeling. It's really interesting to be walking around Amsterdam because the first time I ever came here, I was like 25. And I was traveling around alone by myself. Um, and I have a, a memory of walking in certain places in Amsterdam when I was just a completely, I mean, and it, it, it was very exciting and very lonely. You mm -hmm. know, and it, was, it was sort of a thing. And, and, and now some of that comes back to me. And so I think... I think that on the one hand, she's happy mm -hmm. to be kind of enmeshed and, and involved with all these people that she cares about. And on the other hand, she feels like she never can even think. It's a, an interesting switch, I think, from the character in Depth of Speculation. Mm -hmm. She's really not happy. Or <laughs> I would say there's a, there's a bit in the book that I really love. It's really short. I'll, I'll read mm -hmm. it. It's like only two phrases. Mm -hmm. And she, um, she starts, she, she wanted to become an art monster, mm -hmm. she said. And then uh, something happens and then she says, that night I bring up my old art monster plan. Road not taken, my husband says. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's really unhappy with it, or not? <laughs> well, I mean, I think she is, yeah. I mean, I think because, um, I mean, the difficult thing about, I guess, trying to make something, do something artistic, uh, and also to be a parent, is that you know both of them require sort of a, a, a ferocious amount of effort, um, and and it's not all this sort of uh, silliness about like work-life balance. Like I don't, mm -hmm. I don't actually think there's <laughs> any such thing. I mean, I don't, I think that that's just one of those uh, things that they try to sort of sell you. Like, you know, that, that like, oh yes, some people are perfectly, you know, no, I think mm -hmm. that most people I, I know who, who do some kind of creative thing, they actually just swing back and forth between like doing no, I mean, I, I haven't written in like a, a really written in a couple months and I've been here five days and I've like written, you know, because I'm by myself, I've written so much and, you know, but, but I feel like I, um, she's unhappy because she doesn't really recognize herself anymore. And she sort of doesn't know what she is without being a writer. Um, so that's part of, you know, the art monster thing is a little bit of a joke. Sometimes it's been talked about very, very seriously. I mean, she's 21 when she comes up with this idea. Um, I got the idea for the art monster. I was watching a documentary about, um, I think it was Andrew Goldsworthy. And, uh, and he was sitting at a kitchen table and he was talking and very eloquently about his, his work and his, um, his art and and behind him like they were just like his so all these children were like running and his, his wife was mm -hmm. sort of who I think was an artist too was like dealing with them and he just it, he was so serene like he I just thought oh my god I, uh, why can't I be like that I want to be an art monster um, but yeah but then when you read you know if you don't read the the uh, biography written by the daughter or son of a, of a famous yeah. art monster. They're always very terrible. And you write in the, in the book the same about Nabokov. Oh, yeah. What, can you tell what you write? Yeah, no, that uh, when she's saying at the beginning that, you know, her plan was to be art monster, she says that she read that, um, that Nabokov didn't even fold his own umbrella and that his wife uh, licked his stamps for him. 
<laughs> I think about that when I look a stamp. I'm just like, oh, a waste of my precious time. <laughs> um, but you do both. You're both a mother and a writer. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's been a constant struggle or does it get easier? And mm -hmm. is that also something you... What do people want to hear? <laughs> The, the honest answer. I I'm seeing how, how, how young are people in the audience. Um, <laughs> I think it does get easier in a way, maybe because you just take yourself a little less seriously, mm -hmm. you know, as, as you get older. Um, or some people don't, but maybe I do a little bit. Um, I think, you know, I, I, I sort of joke that I'm like, you know, I'm an art monster from nine to three. <laughs> and then I do pick up, you know. So it's not really, uh, it's pretty contained and like, it's not very, I mean, I'm, it's definitely not nine to three. It's more like nine to three. Um, you know, I'm uh, taking my mom to a doctor's appointment and I'm seeing my mm -hmm. students and I'm walking the dog and I'm doing whatever. Um, but I do feel like what gets slightly easier is maybe trusting that things aren't going to go up in smoke mm -hmm. if I don't. Um, yeah, like I, just, just trusting that maybe... Um, and I have a friend who's, who's a poet who is a sort of, I, I, I jokingly call him my art guru, because he just basically reminds me every time I'm freaking out when I'm writing something. He's like, well, do you remember how you were doing this with weather and with department <laughs> of speculation and with last things and how you thought you, you couldn't write at all and that nothing was going to, and I was like, vaguely, I don't really remember mm -hmm. it. <laughs> um, you said it yourself as well, so I take my mother to the... Uh, to the dentist store, and yeah. and uh, that's what Lizzie does as well. She takes mm -hmm. care of her brother who is falling back, who mm -hmm. has a baby, and then falls back into his yeah, addiction. He's an addict, yeah. yeah, and then uh, she has her son, mm -hmm. a husband. Mm -hmm. She has Sylvie, who she's trying to help. Uh, Mr. Jimmy, of course, of the taxi <laughs> that she <laughs> might fear she's his only client. Yeah. She takes on a lot. Um, uh, depth of speculations also about well, a woman caring and not being able to be an art monster. Mm -hmm. Could you write from the perspective of a man, you think? Hmm. I mean, would it's you? funny. I, I would like to, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a whole sort of thing. I don't know how much it is in the literary community um, here, but there's definitely a, like, stay in your lane idea um, in, in the U.S. now about, like, don't write outside of um, your background and what you, what you know. Um, and I mean, there's a lot of useful things that are coming from that, you know, that basically that we're having maybe a few less terrible books written, you know, falsely from a, from an immigrant experience by like some white person. But, um, but I mean, I feel sort of like, I don't really feel all that male or female. So no. I just feel sort of like it, it seems, and, and I, I kind of love this moment in time really where like m most of my students you know I don't I don't they might present differently on a different mm -hmm. day or they may but but that kind of feeling as a writer has uh you know has always been there that you want to yeah. feel like you can I I sort of go back to the Greeks and saying you know I my ideal version of being a writer is like you know nothing human is alien to me mm -hmm. um and you do come like up against things that you realize no I just can't write about it I don't I, but I don't assume, you know, that I will never write about oh. about anything. Yeah. I was wondering about it because uh, the things they struggle with have a lot to do with inequality. I think. Yeah. Is it is it something you stumble upon when you write about it, or is it also a way to make us aware of how the yeah the the the, the, the gender structures are right built. You know, well, in, in both books, you know, she, she's married to someone who is, you know, is not necessarily, like, stereotypically checked out or that she's not no. doing everything herself. But, um, I mean, I think this, some of it does come from an American perspective of, like, there is just no social net, mm -hmm. you know, there's, yeah. there's nothing. Um, and so... Um, She's not. She, she doesn't really have much money in either, no. neither in department, and and same in weather with Lizzie. And so a lot of it is about kind of that feeling of, um, you know, being living precariously, and that if if you don't if you don't necessarily uh, kind of watch out all the time, you're gonna you're gonna slip even farther. 
um, down through the cracks. And so I think that the inequality then is not necessarily completely gender-based, mm -hmm. but it's about this larger sort of uh, winners-take-all kind of late capitalism mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then at the same time, if I can say, it does come down more often on the shoulders of the women, of course, if mm -hmm. that happens. Yeah. Or would you disagree? Well, I always think about this, <laughs> this moment when my daughter was little and uh, we went to the beach. She was probably about four or five. And I was with another woman who also had a kid that age and, and um, our, our husbands were there too. And, um, and both of the dads are really like involved dads, but we got mm -hmm. to the beach and they both sat down and there were signs everywhere that were like sharks. Watch out for sharks. There's sharks. There's sharks. And, and so I just immediately, like my whole nervous system was kind of like, you know, and, and, and they both just sat down and started reading. And <laughs> I was like, wow, like I'm, you know, because we were like wading in the water with the, with the, with the kids. And, and, you know, the combination of like worrying that they might drown and worrying that a shark would, <laughs> I, it, it just, it was, there was nothing about it that was kind of like a day at the beach. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, and I just, I think about that. That sometimes, like I do feel like there is a probably like the wiring of, and you know, I mean, it's probably good to not have some parent all the time screaming, there's sharks, there's sharks. You know, <laughs> oh, I think God, there's something wrong. to be said for the, um, the, the other side of it too, but, but it wasn't even, um, I couldn't not do it, mm -hmm. like is what I'm saying. It yeah. wasn't like something I very much wanted to sit and like and read you. and be like, Great, you go out and play with the you know sharks, <laughs> but but I, I couldn't I couldn't feel and and I, I really felt it felt very biological mm -hmm. when when my daughter was younger I felt yeah. like I couldn't I was thinking a lot about just keeping making sure she didn't die yeah um, which I, is quite a good thing yeah well, she's maybe. fine no it yeah. turns out I shouldn't have worried that much although also like maybe she would have choked on a grape if I hadn't <laughs> <laughs> if I hadn't been watching um I don't know but yeah I remember coming back from the hospital and a couple days in I just uh my husband just turned to me and he was like how long do you think it's going to be like this where we're just kind of white knuckling it and then we were just both really silent and then I was like it would, for, forever? <laughs> that's gonna just like that's the new thing now. <laughs> so, I want to speak a bit about the climate change yeah. aspect of your book. Mm -hmm. In an interview, you said uh, um, I became interested in why I wasn't more interested. Mm -hmm. And did you, after writing this book, find out why you weren't more interested in the beginning? Yeah, um, I. I think that I was trying, it was just one of these situations where I was trying to figure out why intellectually I understood something, but emotionally I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, one of my best friends is a novelist, um, Lydia Millet. She's also an environmentalist. And so I, I actually talked over the years mm -hmm. all the time about this. And so it wasn't, I, I, did, I did hear sort of the, the bad news yeah. as it was coming down the pike. Um, but it wasn't till... I just sort of forced myself, I guess, to do a deep dive. And then it was terrible. Like it was terrible to have done that because it was, it, it, it just meant that, well, first of all, it's, someone made a website, which I thought was uh, kind of darkly funny, which was called Faster Than Expected. It was just every, like all, it's just climate stories every day where it's like, oh, it turns out this is, you know, insects are disappearing faster than expected. Uh, the glaciers are melting faster than expected. And, you know, so it was sort of like that faster than expected thing, which it turns out the models were really way, way off. Like when I first learned about it and really, frankly, thought most deeply about it, maybe in college or in my 20s, they were saying, this is going to be, you know, your great, great grandchildren are going to live in a very difficult time. And, you know, it's absolutely not only happening now, distributed in different parts of the world, but uh, I know that my daughter, who's 17, is going to live in a, a really, really different world. And I see with my students, I mean, in the last couple of years, I have all these students who are like 19 or 20, and they think like, well, I could never have a kid because I couldn't. I can't justify it mm -hmm. morally. I mean, which is a pretty heavy thing to have to decide when you're that that age, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I wanted to 
to write about what that feeling was. And I thought if I started with someone that was already um, just kind of an environmentalist, um, that, that I wanted to just have someone who's kind of slightly oblivious, not because mm -hmm. she didn't care, but because she actually is caring about so many other people. She's sort of like, how do I worry about the world too? You know, how do I, how do I worry about all of that? Mm -hmm. um, and also because she, she tries to influence the things that, well, she can, but yeah. she, what's she going to do? Yeah, well, I mean, what is she going to do? But, I mean, I think that maybe I went into the writing the novel at the beginning thinking that there was, like, thinking of denial mm -hmm. as just being, like, actually climate denial. Like, that, you, that you're like, this isn't happening or whatever, which, you know... Even many of the people who used to say that don't even say that anymore. But as I as I wrote more, I realized that for me at least, there was like a softer form of denial, which I was guilty of, which was it's just kind of nihilism, you know, just a kind of sense of like, oh, there's nothing that can be done. Mm -hmm. And um, and you know who just wasn't showing that kind of nihilism, whether they thought it or not, were like the people I knew who were scientists or activists. They were like. I feel that too, but I get up in the morning and I do, I do something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I was just trying to see like, what would it be like if a person kind of slowly uh, became more uh, engaged in the world that was like outside of her small circle of, mm -hmm. of usual concern. And you know, it's really tiny in the book. Like she starts to just notice other things. She starts to notice like, uh, animals and leaves and but it's all very kind of she notices how she hasn't been noticing that stuff mm -hmm. and would you say that writing this book is your way of doing something um well I did make a joke a lot during the writing of it where I would like come out of my study and I'd be like Whew, glad I'm <laughs> solving climate change with this small <laughs> experimental novel um you know because it's obviously seemed like a useless thing to do. Um, I, I don't know. All I know is that um, I went from being someone that uh, was absolutely on the sidelines of it to you know, being more actively involved. And, and the main thing to just kind of, um, I mean, my sort of idea is like that there just there really needs to be like activism for hypocrites because I feel like uh, <laughs> we we all th those of us who are not like in that original sort of group of people that were like my daughter's been like a vegetarian since she was seven. She mm -hmm. just came home, seven, announced it. We were like, oh, is it is it because of the animals? She was like, didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> um, but you know, she never ate meat, she never ate meat again, <laughs> and um, and I feel sort of like. Uh, my experience in my earlier days of like talking to people who were environmentalists was that I always just left feeling so, oh God, you know, I'm such a terrible person. I'm doing so many terrible things. And, um, and I just feel sort of like, I don't know if we have time for that or that can't be the only tool anymore. Mm -hmm. I sort of feel like what's really interesting that's happening right now is people are talking across all sorts of disciplines. And they're sort of, when I was on book tour for weather, you know, I was meeting people that were doing things. Um, like I met a woman who was telling me that that she's that, that she's having clients read this book, and she said that she's a um, that she teaches sex ed in high school. And I was like, you know, couldn't see it. But she said because they actually want to talk about how this might affect them down the road. And you know, and that was the little patch of land that she was standing on, you know, and I feel sort of like I see more and more people thinking about how to talk and bring climate into the arena that they already, but if you try to do it, like I try to be a, you know, activist activist and I'm, I just feel like, yeah, I'm just, I'm too old to probably like get chained and onto things like, <laughs> but I mean, I can go and, and, and give these talks and, and do whatever. And it, it does feel kind of pointless at times, but on the other hand, I feel like I I just always return to that like idea that you know Camus talked about in the plague of like active fatalism. I just think you have to you don't know. We all thought you know almost nobody I knew <laughs> except an epidemiologist you know predicted the <laughs> the pandemic, um, and you know that was an example to me of like how 
we don't really have much intellectual humility when we're thinking about what's going to happen in the future. We're like, oh, this is what's going to happen. And, and so I feel sort of like we don't, we don't know as much as we, as we, much as we think we know. And so I try to stay in that place of like maybe being surprised. I mean, probably in a bad way, probably like a, you know, like a tsunami will <laughs> sweep over me. Well, but I, I'm not, I, yeah. I do think it's a it's a it's a good way because the the facts so a lot of people know the facts and that didn't mm -hmm. really do something so maybe in a way literature there's there's a few bits in it I think that um, Lizzie asks Sylvie like what can I do for my mm -hmm. son Eli mm -hmm. and then she says well <laughs> teach him some skills and oh yeah uh, no children for yeah. him yeah. and it's hard in a way that it's sort of it I think it comes in more than, or it, it touches you more than knowing that an ice cap Right, well, maybe. I mean, I read, oh God, I read like four, first I feel like I need to learn the science, then I feel like I need to learn the sociology, then I wanted to late read about communication strategies. Mm -hmm. I read so many books, and at a certain point, I just decided, I'm not going to use numbers in this book. It's not going to be a numbers book because there's lots of people doing fantastic nonfiction mm -hmm. work on this. Like, you know, there's no shortage of that. And so I was just like, I'm just gonna try to see which of these facts stay with me. Mm -hmm. And so the only number that I kept in the book was the moment that New York was gonna go into climate departure, which is 2047, they think. And, and then the, the, the temperature will no longer be in any kind of historical range that, mm -hmm. we, that we've been in. And I just, um, I did have a moment like that when I was learning about this where I just typed in my daughter's, you know, birth date, because that's someone clever made this as a thing and, and it just showed what what the temperatures were going to be like probably in different places. And mm -hmm. um, and it was, that was when I did feel, you know, I'd been like, oh, I'm, I don't, I don't feel this. I just think it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I feel it now. Yeah. And that, that hasn't quite gone away. And after all, all this reading and feeling that, because you, I could, you sometimes when you write it, you can feel the panic. I'm going to write to ask you to write a bit where mm -hmm. I, I really felt it, and even mm -hmm. though it's a different situation. But do you did you did you change your life? Mm -hmm. So do you have a, a oh, this place is a, to this go? is the activism uh, for hypocrites <laughs> part. Um, oh, did I? Get no, 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 not in that, <laughs> not in that sense. But uh, not like did you stop yeah. uh, uh, using plastic or these are made but, of mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. um, no, but more yeah. in the sense that that so it's a lot about the future and how to deal with the future. So and I was wondering, do you have a plan? Do I have a plan? Um, a plan where to go? <laughs> you know, I felt like it was a definite like stage of, of writing this book and thinking about climate change. The stage where you're thinking, where can you go? Mm -hmm. Where can you take your family? And, you know, um, and I think that that's just a normal, it's a normal stage. People get stuck in it who are like uh, doomers and like mm -hmm. preppers. Um, but the truth is, like, um, even when they interview, like, the top climate scientists, I mean, what, what they're really saying is, like, have a passport, have as much flexibility as you can have, like, we can't predict. Um, so I try, I mean, right now I'm doing it not just about climate, but also about, like, political instability. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone would like a, 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 a sort of old Dutch exchange student. <laughs> <laughs> Try to leave America. No, but um, but I'm just saying that, uh, you know, I have a little tiny file on my computer. It's called Tripwire. <laughs> it's not like how to go to other places and, and, and what sort of things. But I think as I, as I got farther into it, I just sort of felt like, no, I mean, that may have to happen at some point. Maybe where I, I live won't be livable anymore. But, but it's more about like trying to, instead of materially prepping, thinking of what you should have, like trying to emotionally and just almost like philosophically, like think about what it means. Because the truth is, I mean, it is an illusion <laughs> that we live securely now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it is an illusion, but it's one that um, some of us in the Western world have been able to feel um, for a while now, but it's not, it's not true necessarily. I mean, things, things have always upended um, these kind of certainties. So I guess that's kind of the way I sort of go around it in my head. Um, would you read another fragment for me? 
I think <coughs> in this bit, well, the, the panic uh, that you can have as a human was very beautifully <laughs> written down. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah, this is about um, right after the um, election when Trump was elected, which, um, you know, many, many people did not believe he was going to be elected. So it hit a lot of people as a real shock. After the election, my husband makes many small wooden things, one to organize our utensils, one to keep the trash can from wobbling. He spends hours on them. There, I fixed it, he says. A turtle was mugged by a gang of snails. The police came to take a report, but he couldn't help them. It all happened so fast, he said. And in the ether, People asking the same questions again and again to the yours to losers, to the both the samers, to the wreck it allers. Are you happy now? The path is getting narrower. That's how Ben told me when we were watching. He was doing the math in his head, but it could still, it's not impossible. And so we stayed up and watched to the very end. At school, Eli's friend boasts that he will kill the president using a lightsaber. Then he says, no, a throwing star is better. My son comes home upset. His friend is going about things the wrong way, he thinks. What is the right way, I ask him. Dig a trap, cover it with leaves. <laughs> There's advice everywhere, some grand, some practical. The practical advice spreads quickly and creates consequences. Women of reproductive age are being encouraged to get IUDs. They can last six to 12 years and so might last, outlast the shuttering of the clinics. But it's suddenly hard to get in to see a doctor. The appointments are all booked for months and the waiting rooms at the walk-in clinics are full of nervous white women. Do angels need sleep? It is unlikely though he cannot be completely sure. Should we get a gun, Ben asks? But it's America. You don't even get on the news if you shoot less than three people. I mean, isn't that the last right they'll take away? He looks at me. His grandfather's last name was twice as long as his. They shortened it at Ellis Island. It was the same after 9-11. There was that hum in the air. Everyone, everywhere, talking about the same thing. In stores, in restaurants, on the subway. My friend met me at the diner for coffee. His family fled Iran one week before the Shah fell. He didn't want to talk about the hum. I pressed him, though. Your people have finally fallen into history, he said. The rest of us are already here. Everything is better in the quiet car. In the quiet car, everyone is calm. Ben presses his leg against mine. We read side by side as Eli builds many roomed mansions. A person across the aisle who is chatting with his friend in Spanish is asked to leave by the conductor. Right now, he says, while the train is moving. In the hotel room, there are many hotel channels, but all disappoint. We go to the Smithsonian Museum. They want to see the space stuff. I want to see the hominids. In the afternoon, we tour the monuments, speak solemnly about democracy. Coming to DC was my husband's idea. It's creepier than I imagined it to be. Soon, soon, soon is the loop in my head. Ben has this plan to spend the next few months visiting historical things with Eli. I want to lay a foundation, he told me, but for what exactly? He doesn't say. Our very last stop is the Spy Museum. Ben grumbles because I seem to have picked the only museum in the city that is not free. He says he'll wait in the lobby. I'm happy, though, because we narrowly missed having to go to the Holocaust Museum. Eli is excited about this place. We are given a cover story, must memorize it quickly, then answer a series of questions. There is a hidden passageway that kids can crawl through. I limp around looking at the exhibits. There are lipstick guns, camera guns. But the best thing is an ordinary looking pair of glasses, cyanide tipped. 
to be used if you are caught by the enemy, so you don't betray anyone. Thank you yeah. very much. I was wondering when uh, when did you write this after the election? Um, I wrote. Uh, I had written about three quarters of it mm -hmm. when the election happened, and then uh, I was really, yeah, I was I was really unsure what to do because basically, if I didn't put the election in, it would um, be kind of frozen in amber, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but if I did put the election in, ugh. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and also there were, I, I just felt like. Um, I mean, I've seen a lot of novels like this. You know, the, uh, Trump is such a sort of um, grotesque, like, caricature, really, of, like, a, a, of someone that, like, it's hard to make it... I People try to put his words in novels all the time, and they try to show what he said. Um, but it, other people have already heard that. Like, it doesn't... I, I think it sort of, like, loses... It's like... Um, you know how if you see a play or something that was once really um, influential, like the you know Ibsen's A Dollhouse, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll say like, oh, the the door slam heard around the world. Except it isn't that for people that go to it now, because so many things have been influenced by that, and and so that's kind of um, you know what, what what I was thinking about how to write the election. I ended up putting only. I mean, my idea was that. I wouldn't like say it by name, mm -hmm. but I would try to make it so that if someone was reading it from another country or at a different time, they would know the kind of person who had been elected. That's what I was trying to to show. And there's some um, I put some excerpts in there from um, this book by this uh, scholar um, who wrote a book called On Tyranny that was about um, Timothy Schneider. Yeah, yeah. Timothy Schneider. Um, my friend jokes that I have a crush on Timothy Snyder. He's always like, oh, I heard your boyfriend, <laughs> Timothy Snyder. On the radio. <laughs> um, he's a very solemn, like, democracy scholar. Um. He's been on this stage, <laughs> but I have to tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know if that answered your question or not. Yes, you did. Um, I'm going to think if I want to know something more about this. <laughs> You see, yeah, because you said I was I was distracted by Timothy Snyder in my head. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Um, because you 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 compare it also to nine eleven. But did mm. you did you say did I understand correctly that you wrote already quite a bit of it before it? Yeah, happened? no, I'd written I'd written did a you, huge so portion of it. Did you know? Um, did you know it was going to go wrong? I or wrong. I was <laughs> I was a little more worried than some people I knew, mm -hmm. just because I um, I went to school in in the South, and mm -hmm. I know that there is a version of racism that a lot of people in the North don't know, which is that someone w it's like I just it's like secret racism, like they're just not gonna but but once they go in the voting booth, they'll they'll do that, um, and so I just had a. You know, I was like, I didn't really trust all the polls. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, I'm not very mathematical. And there was all these, like, mathematical <laughs> things. And, you know, my husband's pretty good at that stuff. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I did think, like, oh, you're just being, you know, you're just being, like, a depressive person who thinks that the worst thing will happen. Like, it's probably not true. Mm -hmm. But then I was angry later that I, like, let my <laughs> guard down. I was like, all those people, like, you know, forced me out of my normal way of being, like, negative and bracing. Um, but... <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, it was obviously the least of, the least sort of problem that you could talk about. But uh, I do think that, um, it, yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know how to write, how to write it. And can you, also, it was already a pretty, it was already a pretty dark book. You know, it had all the climate stuff yeah. in it. And then this. Um, and it's got the brother, you know, I really wanted to write about that kind of caretaking where something kind of goes round and round and round. And you might think that you're getting out of it or that things are getting better and then it goes back around again, you know, which can happen sometimes when you're doing elder care or with somebody who's like in the throes of like an addiction. So I wanted to kind of get that feeling of like how you think you're out of it and then you're not. So I just was, I wasn't sure how to add that. Um, but I did, I don't know if this happened here. There was this actually, oh, I realize it's based on a, I think it's based on a Dutch thing. There was this little thing that was happening in New York on the subways um, where people started to wear safety pins 
on there. Mm -hmm. did, did you guys, I don't know, you probably didn't have that here. People were wearing safety pins um, to show that they were like, didn't vote for Trump and were not allied with that. And, but it was a very kind of, it was a slightly weird thing. And the idea, I guess, was from, I think, like from the Dutch resistance that people used to have ah, their skirts, the they would put, yeah. yeah. And then you would be able to sort of show that mm -hmm. was like a, so somebody wrote about this and, and somebody had this idea. And, but it was just like the first couple of weeks, you just like riding on the subway. And it was a lot of like people trying to show that they were like allies with the people that would be most affected by Trump being elected. But then like most of the like people who weren't white and middle class just thought it was stupid. And also then some like neo-Nazis like read about it and started mm -hmm. like, you know, so it was just one of these things where, so I wanted to kind of capture that atmosphere where people were trying to figure out what to do and nobody, nobody knew. Cause there was just this huge amount of information that was circulating all the time, you know, like telling you what to do and telling you how to prepare because they're in, it, there's this period where someone's elected and then you have like, let's see, he was elected in November and then you mm -hmm. have till January, the end of January before he comes yeah. into office. So everybody, you know, it was a very frantic period. Um, and so I was trying to capture that and that's what I'm talking about with that hum a little bit. Mm -hmm. Cause I did, I did live in New York um, through 9-11 and there was just this really strange moment where you would just be walking around and everyone would be talking about the exact same thing, mm -hmm. obviously. But like, it was like that in a way that there was just this like ambient sort of hum and dread. And, and then there were also a few people that were very excited uh, that he'd been, and, and, and there was this sort of these outbursts of um, like anger and hostility. Um, and yeah, like, you know, Jewish people started being attacked and um, Asian people, started, you know, there's just all these things started happening um, right afterwards. So I was trying to write about that without, I guess, um, taking it over more than I, you know, mm -hmm. know about. What did you think of the pins? Of the pins? In the subway? I mean, I sort of, I felt like, I wish, it, it might have been a good idea before social media. <laughs> um, uh, I, I don't know, like it, it, it felt to me like it was doomed to not work. Um, and I also think that, um, Yeah, I think I sort of thought like, oh, is that a good idea? Maybe, but then I sort of thought it through and thought, but then I just remember being on the subway. I actually think I noticed all these people with safety pins in their collars and I went home and Googled like safety pins. <laughs> like why is everyone wearing safety pins? And then I saw it. And you know, if I can do that, so can a neo-Nazi. So. Yeah, so <gasps> that's the best thing. Uh, I want to ask you one more thing on something completely different. Yeah. Um, because, uh, There you write something about writing that I find very beautiful. <laughs> so I'm going to read that to you. And I was, well, I'm going to read this first. She is the main character of uh, Depth of Speculation. She has wanted to sleep with other people, of course, one or two in particular. But the truth is she has good impulse control. This, that is why she isn't dead. Also, why she became a writer instead of a heroin addict. She thinks before she acts. Or more properly, she thinks instead of acts. A character flaw, not a virtue. <laughs> Is that true, do you think, for a writer, thinking instead of acting? Uh, it's very true for me. I don't know if I could say for all <laughs> writers. You know, there's those writers like uh, Hemingway that go to the bullfights. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I mean, I just sometimes I think about how when I was in high school in this sort of lame city and... And I worked at a record store, and I, I first heard like the Velvet Underground, and I was like, get me to that place. I want to go where they're all doing heroin in New York. Um, and, and, uh, and it was just like a sort of a, I want to be somewhere that is not, uh, is not here. And then I, I just think about like, but actually, when I was later sort of in a world where that particular dream, as it were, could have happened. Instead, I was just like observing it all and thinking about it. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 um, and that was sort of, I think there is a way sometimes as a writer that you're always a little bit, 
I mean, I was, I was, I think I was joking to you before the thing. I'm in this um, lovely apartment uh, for the writer in residence, and it's right over Spal, and so it's just like belly of the beast, right? Like everybody's like partying all night and everything, and it does feel very like an actual literalization of being a writer because I just like I'm just in the house like in my sweatpants like eating you know chocolate looking out the window as like everybody's doing or, or the other day like looking out the window as like all these naked people went by but you know I'm just sort of like yeah this is this is this is what I like like I like this like where I can see it I can hear it mm-hmm. um but I don't necessarily have to be in the hurly burly of it mm-hmm. but yeah I do think um I do you know you always wish you're something you're not and I certainly uh, the same thing that maybe allows me to write because you know, to write you just have to sit alone in a room it's um it's not it's not very fun I'm always wondering I mean it's fun to me but I'm always wondering about all those people who have really exciting things but they want to be a writer uh, like they're like a, they're like I don't know they're like a movie star mm-hmm. or they're a musician something really good and they're just like what I really want to do is write a novel and you're like really I don't think so I think you're just gonna have so much more fun being in a band um, but uh, but yeah <laughs> so pick the bands pick the band that'll be my my deathbed I should have been in a band <laughs> Thank you very yes, much. Thank you so much. And thank you guys all for coming. <laughs> Thanks pleasure. for coming. And uh, uh, we have a few more programs before uh, uh, well, summer holidays start. So please come. And otherwise, I hope to see you in, uh, well, m- m- not me in September, but <laughs> my, my colleagues do make a lot of beautiful things as well. So hope to see you. They, they hope to see you then. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.